everyone, it's Nicole from The Pearl Review. Today I'm happy to talk with you about two great books I've read lately that I think go very nicely together and would be great to be reviewed together, as I think through their different strengths and contrasting styles have led me to get a good first glimpse at the pre- and interwar period of Vienna. I know that's a pretty specific subject, but because of a lot of nonfiction reading I've been doing lately, I got really interested in the Belle Epic era, especially regarding Vienna, as it was a period of high culture and intellectualism in European history. And that era is uh, the turn of the century, uh, 20th century, to 1914, the beginning of World War I, as I understand it. So the first of the books that I want to talk about is Stefan Zweig's The World of Yesterday. And the second is by his friend and contemporary Joseph Roth, and that is The Hotel Years. The first book is a memoir, and the second one is a collection of journalistic vignettes. So both of them are nonfiction, but in very different styles, um, about roughly the same subject. Zweig was an Austrian author who was maybe the most popular writer from his country during his own era. I was compelled to read this after finishing Tony Jutt's Thinking the 20th Century, where Zweig's memoir is mentioned a few times. The World of Yesterday chronicles Zweig's early childhood to the year of the book's completion, which is a year before Zweig himself dies at age 60. And yet, it doesn't? As its title suggests, this book focuses on Zweig's surrounding, his world. Vienna and other major cities like Paris and London during the Belle Epic years. Uh, and then also he covers the interwar period and the first half of World War II. He dies in 1942. Again, the book is wrapped up in 1941. Um, what we have here is something very special in my opinion. Stefan Zweig traveled a lot during his youth, and he had the privilege of meeting some of the greatest artists and thinkers of his time. I think most strikingly, we meet James Joyce, Sigmund Freud, Rainer Maria Rilke, and Rodin, uh, but Zweig comes into contact with a lot of people. I can't mention all of them here. In a way, this actually reminds me of Hemingway's A Movable Feast, but I find this one obviously more touching because of... The, the great tragedy um, of this book as well. The Belle Epic portion of this book is really charming. His descriptions of Vienna, which was then one of the greatest cities in Europe, are wistful and bittersweet. This is what Jutt was mo most interested about, his capturing a Viennese society and the Jewish community that helped build it that was lost forever. And I think if a historian is constantly referring to a memoir within his own book, that's quite a high compliment. Zweig is convinced that the world that he had the pleasure of growing up in, one of culture, idealism, fraternity, is lost forever because of the world wars and also um, the civil war in Austria. And I don't think he is remiss in thinking so. This is the kind of book that makes you scratch your head and ask why. Why was it all thrown away? And though Zweig does not stay on this point for very long, Vienna's high culture was due to a great extent to this Jewish community, which was ultimately destroyed by World War II. I'm going to include here a clip from the audiobook narrated by David Horovich. In hardly any other European city was the urge towards culture as passionate as in Vienna. For the very reason that for centuries Austria and its monarchy had been neither politically ambitious nor particularly successful in its military ventures, native pride had focused most strongly on distinction in artistic achievement. The most important and valuable provinces of the old Habsburg Empire that once ruled Europe, German and Italian, Flemish and Walloon, had seceded long ago. But the capital city was still intact in its old glory as the sanctuary of the court, the guardian of a millennial tradition. The Romans had laid the foundation stones of that city as a castrum, a far-flung outpost to protect Latin civilization from the barbarians. And over a thousand years later, the Ottoman attack on the west was repelled outside the walls of Vienna. 
The Nibelungs had come here. The immortal Pleiades of music shone down on the world from this city. Gluck, Haydn and Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms and Johann Strauss, all the currents of European culture had merged in this place. At court and among the nobility and the common people alike, German elements were linked with Slavonic, Hungarian, Spanish, Italian, French and Flemish. It was the peculiar genius of Vienna, the city of music, to resolve all these contrasts harmoniously in something new and unique, specifically Austrian and Viennese. Open-minded and particularly receptive, the city attracted the most disparate of forces, relaxed their tensions, eased and placated them. It was pleasant to live here in this atmosphere of intellectual tolerance and unconsciously Every citizen of Vienna also became a supranational, cosmopolitan citizen of the world. Zweig also gives us a glimpse into the building up of uh, World War II. He describes the Nazi party in its nascent form, and the rising tensions felt quite markedly in Austria, obviously Germany's neighbor and a cultural, I don't know, I have not enough um, knowledge about it, but Austria and Germany obviously are are closely linked. Um, they share a language. Zweig actually mentions that Hitler lives at some point not far from where he does before anyone knows who he is. Uh, it's very spooky. Zweig being Jewish describes well the rise of anti-Semitism through personal experience in this part of the book. I think it's interesting to witness this with his and Roth's work to see, you know, the, the coming of the storm before everything goes to hell. Um, though this book is not perfect, the book even during its happy moments seems gloomy. Um, I say this not to be cruel given the subject of this book. There's just something underwhelming about the prose. It's um, a little, little bland. Also Zweig, by removing himself so much from the book and focusing on the famous artists he spends time with, and all of the relics and, and mementos that he catalogs for himself comes across sort of like a Victorian fanboy. And that's a, a little grating at times if, if I want to be, you know, critical and analytical of the book. Nevertheless, this book is an interesting artifact of a world we will never get back. Also, for anyone who's a fan of Wes Anderson, Grand Budapest Hotel's central influence is Vig, and I have to say that Ralph Fine's character might have been a parody of him. I don't know. You guys decide. In preparing for this review, I stumbled on a rather scathing review of this book. The author himself had described Vig as the Pepsi of Austrian authors, and I scratched my head and I thought, hmm, that name looks familiar. And then I realized that he is actually the translator and editor of the other book that I was reading, none other than Joseph Roth's Hotel Years. And that is to say, Michael Hoffman. Hoffman debated Zweig's stature and even purported that many of his contemporaries, including Joseph Roth himself, did not like him. He went so far as to say that Robert Musil, author of the masterpiece The Man Without Qualities, a novel written about the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and maybe the most iconic work that is related to both of the authors I'm including here, did not even want to be on the same continent as Zweig when hearing that he had moved to South America and he himself was considering going. I felt this to be a rather nasty article, but having the pleasure of reading the hotel years, I understand his passionate opinion. My God, what a gem the hotel years is. What a gem Joseph Roth is. Michael Hoffman, the translator, put together many of Roth's Fleetons? Fleetons? I don't know how to pronounce this word, I'm sorry. These impressionistic journalistic vignettes he wrote during the interwar periods in Austria, Germany, the Soviet Union, and also in the Balkans. Each piece is only about four pages, but they are simply remarkable. Roth's style shines in this translation. His imagery is poetic and comic. He is bitingly witty, and each little story seems to me like a paper lantern. It's colorful, luminescent, it's lovely. 
And what he gives us, I think, is a glimpse into places that are no more, into a world, in my opinion, that is not often covered in literature or cinema, at least in the United States. I'm going to read you the first one, uh, the first piece in this book, just so you can have a taste of what I am talking about. Of Dogs and Men To the many scenes of war misery in Vienna, a new one was added a few days ago. A man returned from the war in the form of a hinge, invalid, with shattered spine, moves almost inexplicably through Kartnerstrasse, selling newspapers. A dog sits on his back. A clever, well-trained dog, riding on his own master and making sure he doesn't lose a single paper. A modern fairy tale being, combination of man and dog, thrown up by the war and set down in the misery of Kartnerstrasse. A sign of the times in which dogs ride men to protect them from other men. A memory of those great times when men were trained like dogs and were barked at as Schweinhund, and so forth by others who were themselves bloodhounds, though heaven help you if you call them that. A result of patriotism that makes the upright likenesses of the creator dependent on four-footed creatures who lack the spiritual distinction to become heroes or cannon fodder and at the most did odd jobs in the ambulance service. On the invalid's chest dangles an Emperor Karl Troop Cross, on the neck of the dog a mere dog tag. The bearer of the Troop Cross is a victim, the one with the dog tag is active. He guards the suffering of the invalid, he keeps the man from further harm. His fatherland and fellow being could only hurt him. He has them to thank for being watched over by a dog. Sign of the times. Once there were sheep dogs who watched herds of sheep and guard dogs that guarded houses. Today, there are man dogs who watch invalids. Man dogs, the logical consequence of submissive men. The scene struck me with the force of a revelation, a dog seated on a man. When he remembers what happened when he relied on other men, a man is happy to put his trust in a dog. Is there anything so sad at this sight, which seems so emblematic? All around stroll the war profiteers with their x-ray vision and in the midst of everything, a mounted dog. The human race has lost, all hail to the animal. We have been through the war that was the last hurrah of the cavalry, and at the end of it, dogs ride around on men. August 1st, 1919. These books are wonderful companions to each other. Zweig's World of Yesterday has more of a larger scale narrative to it um, Zweig speaks of cities, of nations, of armies, of Hitler. Um, however, his style is very restrained and it can be a bit bland. Zweig gave me the big picture, but Roth painted me the small scenes in burning colors and biting humor. I'd recommend either, but I am totally in love with the collection of Joseph Roth and will definitely go on to read his more famous fictional work, The Radetzky March. Both of these authors also are notably Jewish Austrians who died before the end of the Second World War. Zweig took his life in 1942 and Roth died of alcoholism in 1939. I think their grief was insurmountable and their testaments are worthy ones to give your time and attention to. Thanks for listening. I hope that worked as a dual review. I hope all is well for you and your families during this difficult time. Take care. Bye.